Hello, everybody. Um, okay, so let me just get the screen share thing. Okay, so this is the actuators webinar. Um, so I'll just be giving a presentation about kind of about our actuator system and general actuator systems on AEVs, and then I'll be answering people's questions. So if they want to email me, it's just ERT45 at cornell.edu. Um, okay, so uh, common types of actuators. Uh, so you can have compressed air CO2 on your sub. Um, and so this is just kind of an overview. And after this, I'll go over stuff in more detail. But um, anyways, with compressed air, usually you use valves to control your output and your input. Um, examples of uses of these are torpedoes, droppers, and pistons. Um, electrically, mostly you use like servos, motors, um, you can use solenoids. Magnetically, you can, you can use magnets. And then also just combinations of all of these to create um, an actuator system. So a very common actuator system on AEVs is the compressed air or CO2. Um, and so the way you usually supply these for air, um, what we do is we have a scuba tank actually. And um, we're able to get that refill on campus, which is, so one reason we use air over CO2 is um, that basically we don't have a way to uh, easily fill up CO2, um, but we're able to fill up the scuba tank um, for free, basically. Uh, but I know CO2 you can actually get a little bit more smaller um, kind of cartridges for, like with paintballs, uh, paintball tanks, they get kind of big if you want to have like a really long, um, a lot of shots. But with CO2, it's usually a little bit smaller, which is kind of nice. Um, but anyways, so for compressed air, we use a scuba tank. Um, so let's refill easily. There's just a valve on that and it lasts a decent long time. Um, so this is an example of Ninja paintball tanks, pictures you can see. Um, one thing you want to make sure you do uh, w with a uh, paintball tank is that you also get a regulator that comes directly after the paintball tank um, because competition rules say that uh, you don't want to have any compressed air that's over 100 PSI, and these are definitely over that. So basically you just have to... Ooh, that's... Wait, is it not working? I think you're just screen sharing the wrong screen. Ooh. Oh dear. One second. I think I'm screen sharing the wrong screen, guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh dear. Entire screen, entire screen. And then can you turn on? Yes. Let's see if that worked. No? There's a 30 second delay. So. Okay, we're going to wait 30 seconds and see if that worked. Just <laughs> right now. Plus or minus five. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it could be negative four people. Okay, um, let's see. It doesn't look like the screen share. You can see that? Okay, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Anyways, um, I didn't realize I was sharing the wrong screen. But So the last slide I was on was this one, just common types of actuators. Um, anyways, and so these are examples of paintball tanks. Yeah, so just make sure you regulate it down to 100 PSI. As I mentioned, you can also use compressed CO2. Um, they have options CO2 paintball tanks, but they also have, um, I know some teams use replaceable cartridges, um, possibly only at competition, which is uh, a neat idea. So you can also use that. Um, let's see. And then, so uh, another topic, if you're using compressed air CO2, you're going to have to use basically solenoid valves to regulate the output. Um, and so valve selection is a big part of the actuator system. Um, so I'm going to go over different types of valves. So one you see here is the two-way valve, which is two position. Um, so this is a valve schematic, which is to help you understand how um, the air will flow. So basically, the only options you have with the two-way valve is either um, you're not going to blow any air or you're blowing air out. Um, and so the way, so the way solenoid valves work is usually you have a manifold that connects all of the valves 
um, and your uh, painful tank is connected to your regulator, which is connected to your uh, valve manifold. And so you, basically you can um, have your valves closed and then open certain ones, um, which depending on what type of valve they are will do different things. So with a two-way valve, when you open it, um, you can only open it to let air out. So um, it's nice if, if you, that's all you want. It's great. Um, but if you want to do some other more complicated things, then uh, there are other options. So there are also three-way valves. Um, so with three-way valves, you can either be blowing or exhausting air. So uh, one thing to know with three-way valves, if they're two position, you cannot um, just have no airflow through them. Um, so what you see on the left is that you see uh, basically your paintball tank would be connected to the output. So that means you're blowing air. And then on the right, you, uh, your um, outside source of air will be connected to your exhaust. And so it's going to be venting air from wherever your valves are connected from to. And so um, two options with that is you can either have them normally closed or normally open. And what that means is if you are to have your valves normal, your three valve normally closed, um, you're going to be venting the air from whatever your valves are connected to. If you have it normally open, you're going to be blowing air from your paintball tank to whatever they're connected to. Um, and then you can also have four-way valves, which are pretty cool. And with four-way valves, you have um, two options. You can have two-position four-way valves or three-position four-way valves. So um, on the left, you see three-position, and on the right, you see two-position. So the way three-position four-way valves work is that, so in the middle you see that that means it's completely closed. Like there are no lines connecting either side. Um, that's, so that's a really nice option to have. And then also on the left you see that basically you will have, um, four, uh, you will be able to uh, blow air from your paintball tank to whatever your valves connect to as well as exhaust air. Um, and so you would have two ports going into the valve for that. Um, and then you would also have two exhausts from the valve. Um, and then on the right, basically it switches. So whatever you are blowing air to, you're now venting. And whatever you are venting air from, you're now blowing air to. Um, and then on the right, it's basically the same valve, except you don't you do not have the option to have it closed. Um, so you can you, you'll you'll always be uh, giving air to something and taking air away from something. Um, and so one thing, some things to take into consideration when you're choosing valves is um, the, sorry, there's a typo, uh, max output pressure that you want. That's going to be very important looking at whether or not you're going to have enough pressure to um, actuate whatever you want to actuate. Uh, and then also the max input pressure. That's important as well because you'll need to um, make sure that is compatible with whatever the output pressure of your regulator is. Um, because uh, valves usually, if they have too high of a pressure going to them or too low of a pressure, they just won't work. Um, and so that's one thing you can run into, which might be a bit difficult to debug if you have your valves hooked up and you're trying to actuate them and you don't know why they're working. Um, it could be that you're not supplying the correct pressure to them. Um, and another thing with them that you want to look at is the flow rate as well, um, because that can determine, I mean, if you have pistons, that will determine how fast they close. Uh, if you're firing torpedoes pneumatically, that will be very important to whether or not they will go um, far or anything. And then also just the voltage range as well, because um, they have a lo uh, lot of different voltage ranges. So, um, And then also, valve enclosures can be a bit tricky sometimes. Um, it's, it's really not too bad uh, after you kind of get the hang of them. But um, one thing, you're always going to need is to have an exhaust for the valves. So the way we set up our valves is actually our valves, so they they uh, exhaust air just into the enclosure. Like they're not set up to exhaust air out of the enclosure. What happens is that when they the enclosure is set up to exhaust air out of the enclosure. So the way you have it hooked up is that the enclosure, you can't see it in this picture, it's on the other side, but the enclosure just has a uh, check valve, a tube um, that's sealed and it has a check valve going out. So, you know, water can't go in, but air is free to vent. And so that'll kind of even out the pressure when you're under underwater. And then when your valves fire a little bit of extra air, that's going to just release the pressure. Um, let's see. Um, and also, uh, the way we usually do it is, so we obviously seal the valves on the inside, and then we use O-rings to actually seal around the tubing. Um, 
you could use drill to install uh, for these types of O-rings, but you can also use uh, push to connect fittings if you want. Um, then, then you don't have to really deal with O-rings with that. You just have to make sure that your threading is sealed. Um, that's kind of nice because it's also really easy to remove tubing that way. You don't have to worry about, you know, whether your O-ring is okay or not. Okay, so other types of actuators, um, servos. So uh, a nice thing to note about servos is that they have a set increments of turn. Um, and so you, you can use these if you need to, you know, only actuate something so far instead of using a DC motor, which is going to continuously turn. Um, another nice thing about servos is you can get them in a lot of different sizes. You can get them really small. Um, they also get large as well, but oftentimes they're a lot smaller than uh, motors or stepper motors. Um, and so if you're space limited, this is a good option. Um, one thing to note, though, is they're not usually, they don't usually have a huge amount of torque or speed. Um, and that kind of comes with the fact that they're small and they're also pretty cheap. Some of them also have plastic gears, so if you're using something with high torque, make sure you get a servo with metal gears because you don't want your gears stripping when you're working on something. Um, and then there's also stepper motors. Um, so basically these can be a replacement for servos because uh, they also work in set increments of rotation. Um, however, they're usually A, more expensive, but they have better speed and torques and one another another thing though is they're usually larger than the servos they don't come in as small sizes but if you need something that's um to actuate something heavier or whatever this is a better option um so also you have brush dc motors so at the bottom i have a diagram of a brush dc motor and a brushless dc motor um so these are two options you have when you're selecting dc motors um so with brush um so some cons is that they're usually a bit cheaper, um, and they're also simpler to control if you're making your own motor controller boards, which is nice. Um, but they also require they require more maintenance than brushless DC motors. Um, so it, you need to just make sure you maintain them on a regular basis to whatever like specification they need. Um, but if you do that, they should be fine. Um, another thing though is that uh, with brush DC motors, they actually when they get up to high uh, speeds. Uh, they um, actually get friction, which reduces their torque. Whereas on the next slide, um, you can see that with brushless DC motors, they don't actually create any friction. Um, so they basically have a pretty flat curve, which is kind of nice because a lot of times you're operating these at high speeds. Um, also, you can't usually operate the brushed DC motors as at high speeds as you can with brushless. Um, and so brushless DC motors, so they require less maintenance, which is, which is nice. Um, and they're also very high efficiency. Um, they have high output power, high speed range. Um, their specs tend to be nicer, but they're also more expensive, which makes sense. Um, and they have a lot. Uh, their controller needs to be a lot more complicated. Um, but it's completely doable. Um, so I'm not sure how many teams use solenoids for actuators, but you can do it. Um, so basically the way the solenoid works is you have the coil of wires wrapped around uh, a tube and then you have, um, say like a magnet or a ferromagnetic metal on the inside and when you uh, send current through the solenoid, that's going to create a magnetic force on um, whatever's on the inside, which will move it. Um, and so, you know, ideas for applications for this would be like torpedo launchers. For instance, however, um, one thing to note with these is that usually you're not going to get a huge amount of force from this, um, which is probably why it's not seen so much. Um, but it could be used for like smaller things. So you just need to like uh, actuate a really small um, something to like let something out, like droppers. Say they're held in by something, and you just activate a solenoid to let them drop. Like you could do something like that. In which case, these would be useful. Um, and then you can also use magnets. Uh, um, one thing to note with magnets is that um, they will mess with your sensors. So that's that's a problem we've encountered. Um, that's also something with thrusters and brushless motors. If you have them right next to your compass, it will probably mess up the calibration with that uh, because you know motors use magnets, and these these are very uh, strong magnets as well, especially compared to um, the Earth's magnetic field. A lot of times it's just what your compass is measuring, right? So uh, this is going to create a strong effect. 
Um, of course, you can always move them farther away. This will definitely help uh, as the magnetic field decreases a lot. Or if it's a constant magnetic field, um, that also shouldn't mess with it as much. Okay, so general applications for uh, these types of actuators. Um, a lot of times you see pistons, uh, pneumatic pistons. So you have solenoid valves that are connected to either side of a piston. Um, and then these are very useful for grabbers. A lot of teams use them for that. Um, as you can see on the right, that's an example of how a piston would be hooked up with an arm to actuate a grabber to grab something underneath the AV. Um, but they could also be used with forward manipulators uh, or, I mean, in general, like very, very wide usage of things, depending on like what you hook them up to, right? Um, and then, so with pneumatic uh, torpedoes and droppers, that's also pretty popular. How that is uh, set up is usually like you have a torpedo in a tube and you hook up uh, one of the uh, pneumatic tubes to the um, torpedo tube and basically just a burst of air is going to release the torpedo. Um, and this is a pretty, uh, what's really nice about the system is that it's very simple. Um, one thing you just need to make sure is that uh, you are able to supply enough air to fire the torpedoes far enough. So that's another thing um, why you want to really look carefully when you're selecting your valves. Um, and also that means you kind of really have to make sure your torpedoes are very uh, hydrodynamic so that they're going to fly straight. Because, you know, after they leave the tube, they're not going to have any external forces on them besides gravity. Um, and then droppers also another way. So the way we uh, sometimes have done our droppers is that we basically just have a heavy object that's held in with small magnets. And then a burst of air uh, dislodges them from the magnets and just lets them drop. So that's a way you can combine all of these things, um, all of the past types of actuation to basically create some kind of actuator on your sub. Um, uh, so you can also make thrusters, um, usually those use DC motors, um, brushless or brush, those are both used. Um, and then forward manipulators, uh, usually basically everything we've talked about can be very applicable for these because, uh, as you know, um, this this challenge changes a lot depending on the year. So, um, for instance, with two years ago, the wheel, you could have used a motor. Um, or, I mean, this say, like, this year, you could have used a piston to kind of, like, reach out and grab the pegs, things like that. Um, okay, so now I'm going to open up the floor to questions. I know I got a question um, a while back that asked... Uh, so the question was, can we use 3D printing with ABS filament for manufacturing the droppers and torpedoes? Um, and so generally, yes. Yes, you can. Um, one thing to note with ABS plastic is that um, if you're trying to... So, so the water's going to go through it, um, so it will sink. Um, but I know we have made uh, torpedoes with ABS plastic. That's completely fine to use. Um, and then droppers... Um, if you can make your design hydrodynamic, that's fine. Uh, usually we try to go for something heavier just so that it will drop more of a straight line. Um, but this is also completely usable. Let's see if I've gotten any more questions. Yeah, nothing, so nothing's gone to spam. Um, okay, well, um, yeah, so no one, no one has sent any emails. I might just wait a couple more minutes in case someone's still sending one, but uh, if you have any emails, you can always email me at ert45 at cornell.edu and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, I hope this was helpful. Anyways, all right. Well, thanks for tuning in, guys. Have a good day.